chased by Alistair Scott. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. Shh. Shh, they're at the back. Because you're in the presence of greatness. John Dawes. Great. This is the Sistine Chapel of Sport. David, Tom David, the halfway line. The Mona Lisa of movement. This is Gareth Edwards. The Beethoven's fifth of rugby tries. And the architect of this genius. Would have written that story and no one would have believed it. The artist behind this impossible dream. A man of Gwent. His name... John Dawes. John Dawes kicks off for London Welsh. Dawes is the Welsh dragon who ruled London. That's Dawes deciding to go on his own. The lion who tamed the All Blacks. Here's Dawes. The double round. And the fire of the modern game. Over they are, and it's a score. Let's see who the last man up is. When he died in 2021, we lost one of the true visionaries of rugby. The legendary former Wales and British and Irish Lions captain John Dawes has died at the age of 80. One of the great Lions captains was laid to rest. In 1971, John Dawes led Wales to the Five Nations Grand Slam and the Lions to their only series win over New Zealand. You become a lion and you, 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 you joined, you have that custodianship of, of Lions rugby. I don't think there's any irony that uh, John Dawes is being laid to rest today and it's hugely significant for me. The Lions made him a legend. The history is written in the 1960s in the corner of Richmond, that will be forever, Wales. This is Old Deer Park, home of London Welsh, the crucible where a glorious brand of rugby was cast, master binded by doors, a style of play which will revolutionise the sport and his home country. Today, some close members of his family are returning for a special reunion at the club John Dawes called home. This is the first time I've been back uh, to Old Deer Park since my uh, father passed away in April. It's bringing back a lot of memories. London Welsh are a great social club. It's a place where Richard Burton might drop in, David Frost would come and watch. It's a kind of glamorous club. It's like a cultural finishing school for, for the Welsh in London. We're going to meet my eldest son, Rodri, and my youngest son, Ewan and big friend of my dad's, uh, John Taylor. John Taylor is probably one of his biggest allies, one of his biggest friends. I mean, they played for Wales together, they played for the British Lions together, so uh, they've been through a lot. The last time I saw John Taylor was at my dad's funeral. He found it at times difficult to, to come to terms with the fact that he wouldn't see my dad again, that you're never going to get that, that phone call or that meeting up in a rugby club, just that chat. And it dawns on you and it's quite difficult to get used to it, to be honest. Well, hello, hello. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, yeah you're you right. Not get the, uh, not get the memo. <laughs> in the middle of a heat wave. <laughs> Shirt and <Come> tie. <laughs> on the show here now, come yeah. on. The legend of John Dawes echoes around these hallowed grounds. His name and the role of honour, his precious achievements preserved behind glass. And his memory carried forever in the hearts and minds of his people and friends. Rodri. Good to see Hi, you. John. You well? Good. Okay. Hello again. Good to see you, Michael. Well, Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. I've come overdressed. <laughs> very formal. <laughs> no, I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, this takes me back. Um, when I arrived here in 1966, uh, I didn't realise at all, you know, that John had effectively started a rugby revolution. And it really was a revolution. And, uh, you know, I became sort of a big part of. 
The revolution may have taken place in leafy Richmond, but its leader was forged in the valleys of Wales. My dad was born in uh, Chapel of Ease and lived there for the first uh, few years of his life. And then he moved to an area called the Pant in Newbridge. His dad was a blacksmith in the local colliery and his mother Gladys was a, was a housewife. From there he went on to the Lewis School Penguin, which I think is labelled the Eton of the Valley. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, for, and it's from there, when he went to there, that's where rugby grew. Very proud to be a Penguin boy he was, and uh, I think at present day the sports hall is named after him there now. John was a war baby. He came from that generation where aspiration was important. He had parents who didn't want him to go down the pit. He was one of the first of his family to go on to university and get a degree. And then from there, he met my mum and she wanted to try a, a luck as a, an opera singer up in London. So they both moved up here in 63. My dad immediately came down to London Welsh to play rugby. He was a Welshman in London and this is where you, you came to play. The club that John joined was a bastion of amateurism with a relaxed and, let's say, informal approach to newfangled ideas like training and tactics. Record at London Welsh before he came was pretty poor. I mean, I understand that some of the senior players would never be seen at Old Deer Park apart from match days. There was no such thing as uh, as training or uh, you know getting to know it you just you know they'd meet in the local hostelry and oh hello I'm, I'm playing the center today with you today and then they'd go and play he's thinking about the game constantly he's a good player he's excited about tactics fitness skills this is way back in the amateur era at a time pre-coaching and yet john was already kind of mentally a player coach we too often in the past have thought, certainly international level, and to a great extent at club level, have thought that you can simply arrive at the ground on a Saturday half an hour before the game with your boots somewhat dirty, thrown in the bag, and that's it. But the game is more than that. It has more to offer. We particularly wanted to develop a kind of total rugby, but John saw a role for kind of athletic, mobile forwards whose skill set was similar to the backs. He was a, a really thorough student of the game. That's Dawes deciding to go on his own. He really thought about it more than anybody else I knew at that time. Training began Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. And it was kind of an unwritten rule that, you know, you didn't turn up for training. Your chances of selection were not good. For Dawes, there were pragmatic reasons for pioneering this electric new style of play. Bob Phillips will be the kicker. We had a very small side at the time. We had big trouble getting the ball, and the mantra was, once we got it, they're not having it back until we've scored. And he's there. As captain, you were coach, and quick passing was what his game absolutely relied on, and that obviously needed great skill and great fitness. This is Helen picking up. London Welsh were very much the main runners of that style of rugby. And John played a huge, huge part in that. He certainly had vision of the game and how it should be played and the way in which they wanted to play it. We have a romantic idea of how the game should be played as Welsh people. John knew that rugby was entertainment. It was a spectator sport. He wanted box office rugby. He wanted to give the great players, you know, the freedom to express themselves. But underpinned by all that, you know, a kind of fitness and discipline and, and tactical nows. The club was attracting the best young talent in London and a golden crop of Welsh exiles. One of them, a promising young fullback studying medicine. His speed and attacking flair soon got doors thinking. JPR immediately impressed on John how effective a running fullback could be. And 68, when he arrived here, he became an absolute integral part 
of the development of the, the John Dawes perfect game. The attitude that we had was to go on the field and to try and win. So it's a, a different attitude than from going on the field and trying not to lose. In other words, go, let's go on and let's take a chance. And uh, most of the time it came off. Well, here he is. This is what he loves doing. To Ellen. This is Richard. You know, we had this idea of running rugby and utilising every man in, in, in the team, including the fullback right to the prop. And fortunately, I seemed to be around when there were great players around. They had a wonderful name in rugby football back at that time. They were renowned for their open, attacking, skillful, talented rugby. And people from all over London, not necessarily Welsh, came to see the team play. And John Dawes had a great deal to do with that. Getting the players out of the pub and onto the training field transformed the fortunes of the national team too. John was part of the rugby revolution in the 60s. There was no coach. But Wales led the way globally in developing coaching. So John's career was parallel to that. But he really did develop a style at club level, take it into the international side and then into the British and Irish Lions side. John Dodd lit the flame under the Welsh Dragon, and boy, didn't they roar. Tell me, Thomas, Edwards de Barry John. Control. John Dodd. Power. Flair. And attack. 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 When you saw those players playing the game, oh, it gave you a thrill, and you wanted to play that type of, of rugby. Out to John Dawes. Winning international matches, playing with flair, with uh, the skip in your step. And John wasn't afraid to say, it's important not just to win, but the way in which you win. Beautiful. And just wait till you hear who inspired John. When he grew up as a boy in Newbridge, the Busby Babes and the sort of the way Man United played in those sort of years in the 50s was something that really encapsulated him as a young boy. And that was something that really in inspired him in terms of how his rugby teams played as well. Play to entertain, play to win but almost the phrase that Busby would say of, don't be boring. The young United team were really exciting. Yeah. And then the lovely thing, of course, is when we actually became part of a successful Welsh team and Lions team, we suddenly mixing with Georgie Best and uh, Bobby Charlton and these people, and yeah. we were school teachers. And we were thrilled to bits. <laughs> <laughs> we kept winning Grand Slams and Triple Crowns and Championships and England kept winning the wooden spoon quite regularly. So it was a really good, <laughs> it was a good time growing up and it just seemed the norm. With a perfect game of rugby crafted at home, Dawes faced a new challenge abroad. In 1971, there was a bigger stage and a larger pool of talent. It was Lions year and New Zealand beckoned. There were seven of us from London Welsh. Gerald Davies, JPR, Mervyn Davies, John Dawes, the captain, and I played in all the tests. So we had a third of the Lions team starting all the tests in New Zealand came from London Welsh. No Lions side had ever won a test series in New Zealand. The tour was a three-month slog, the length and breadth of the country, with Dawes aside playing 22 provincial games, leading to the ultimate challenge of four matches against the seemingly invincible All Blacks. Daunting? Absolutely. But it was a challenge that John relished. He was the kind of captain who was always calm, patient, and always believed at whatever time, we could win. He's under the post. 
Going out to New Zealand was quite a, a mountain to climb in hope of winning. Number eight, Wally to going. Look how he can break close. Edwards doesn't get it. People didn't win Lions Tours in those days. Uh, you went away, uh, you, you, you played hard, but you came second best. John was always confident in the quality of the players and of the team he led. He was a huge help all round uh, to the players, a great pillar of strength when you were going through a difficult time. He was one of the boys, and yet he, he could be management at the same time. It was one of those situations where you, you really felt very early on that, hang on, this is something special. Right from the start, the electric style of play perfected at Old Year Park was put into practice down under and used to punishing effect. I look back on the films of the tries and they're all quite special, the way they move the ball, you know, and it's backs and forwards interacting with one another. Gibson, Williams. As the victories piled up, the belief grew and grew. We're all divers trying to get ahead. It's a fine try. The last touring team hadn't won a single test against the All Blacks, but these Lions were a new breed. Four tests awaited. Willie John McBride opposite me. Willie John Dawes. Barry John. John Dawes. That's the big man. That's John Devon. Number eight for the cross on him. It's a try. It's a try for the Lions. Ball first. And throw forward Ian McLaughlin. 15. Full back Laurie May. Straight away. That tremendous pick up there by Kick. Look at that. Ian Kick practice. The big man. Edwards. He's nearly under the boss. Can he get there? The Barry John and Barry John has scored. What a try. Unbeaten in all their provincial games, they've also, the Lions, have built up a 2-1 lead in the four-match series of tests against the powerful All Blacks. Well, today they played the fourth and final test at Auckland, bidding to become the first winners of a series against the All Blacks on their own soil. With the Lions one up in this pulsating series, Dawes led his bruised men into the final game, knowing one thing, to win or draw would give them a series victory. John. In a thrilling match, the Lions played the John Dawes way. John Dawes, Mike Gibson. Fast hands and feet, physical and hard, and yet always thinking, always tactical. John Williams, the fullback. They played. They thought they way. John Williams was with him. To the draw they needed for a series victory. And that's it. That's it. A drawn match here, 14 points all at Eden Park. But the British Lions have won the series. It's a sport and fairy tale. Nobody gave them a chance. And not only did they win, they won in with a particular style. And that style, I would argue, is a Welsh style cultivated by John Dawes. The enormous satisfaction that we've done it, we've got there, um, to pull that off um, was, was immense. You can only measure it when you look back and realise that nobody else has achieved it. John Dawes, who has done so much, not only for his team, but for British rugby. That was a remarkable contribution that John Dawes made as captain to keep the players happy, together, in good spirit, and in winning form. John, um, what's been the most important thing for you on this tour? Oh, today, without any shadow of a doubt, we came here um, to win the series, dedicated ourselves to win the series, and obviously this is the culmination of all that. We had no inkling whatsoever of what awaited us when we got back to London. 
we didn't fully appreciate uh, the following we'd had from people all over the United Kingdom. Huge crowds. It was amazing. I mean, it, it really did feel like we were stars. In fact, I think most of us were looking around to think, what, have the Beatles arrived? <laughs> oh, and then realized it was all actually for us. It was, it was brilliant. John Dawes, a moment for you to save it tonight because for the first time the Lions really all back together. Yes, it's great to be all back together again, I must admit. Yeah. This is probably the last occasion we'll have to be together. And it's wonderful to be here and to see the film and relive it all again, even part of the singing. <laughs> <laughs> John, for you, uh, what has been the thing that will last in your memory now, having achieved everything that you have in the last 12 months? Probably the year 1971, quite honestly, with um, Wales winning the Grand Slam and the Lions doing so well. Uh, and the way we played rugby football in 1971, this is of course important and I, say, I look back on this this year as I'm sure we all will with a great thrill and know that it's been well worth it. So for one final time, choir master John Barbaroli Taylor led the team in singing a tour favourite, the sloop John B. If 71 was a vintage year, then 18 months later came the chance to repeat that success. The All Blacks returning to British shores, seeking revenge at Cardiff Arms Park. What New Zealand didn't expect was to be on the wrong side of another result and to be disbelieving spectators to the greatest try ever. The showdown was against the Barbarians an invitation side who were John Dawes' Lions in all but name. Well, the Barbarians had chosen as their skipper the successful uh, Lions, Captain John Dawes, to lead the side. Did you view it as the fifth test, John? I think we all did, David, because the Barbarians had based their selection on the 71 Lions and therefore wanted to see that type of game. And, of course, the All Blacks in the International Series, which they had just concluded, were undefeated. So this had all the competitive environment, which was you to make a good game. This, I promise you, is what we've been waiting for for the last three months. And listen to it. The All Blacks were determined to get revenge on what had happened 18 months before. Without question, the feeling in the dressing room before that match was a great deal of apprehension. You had a match in front of your own crowd. Huge amount of pressure. Huge amount of expectation. Referee, Monsieur Dominic. Whiting's catch. I went along to the, 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 the Bar Bars New Zealand game to see the greatest try ever, but uh, we were a little bit late. I never realised it was scored in the first two, three minutes of the game. This is great stuff. Phil Bennett covering. I recognise this try. I think I've seen it quite a few times. My immediate thought was, oh, he's going to kick it to touch. And of course he didn't. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. John Williams. JPR gets the ball and is almost decapitated by the, uh, the New Zealand winger. Pull it. John Dawes. John was moving at speed, interpassing with uh, Tommy David and um, Derek Quinnell. And then here he comes like an express train. It's just an amazing choice. It's, what, it's how rugby should be played. If the greatest writer of the written word would have written that story, no one would have believed it. That really was something. So, John Dawes finished his magnificent career with a hand in the greatest try ever, but also this in another glorious victory over New Zealand a and a first for the Barbars. It's the ultimate team try. It's the ultimate try where everybody has a part to play, whether you're a forward or a back. And the forwards have moments of artistry as great as the backs in that try. Quinnell picking the ball up off his boot, you know, and defying gravity. That try is, is an iconic try and that everyone talked to my father about. You know, was it a dummy, was it not a dummy? You know, well, actually, he would never actually answer that question, to be fair. It'll be like, 
point the finger. <laughs> we all laugh about whether it was actually a dummy or not. It was a dummy because it fooled them. Uh, that's what a dummy is supposed to be. If it wasn't, it was a damn good uh, show of one, wasn't it? I remember seeing a film years ago, the, um, the man who shot Liberty Valance, and it was a newspaperman telling the story, and the punchline at the end of the film was, when the legend is bigger than the truth, print the legend. So if Cliff Morgan says it's a dummy, it's a dummy. John Dawes doing for the Barbers what he did for the British Lions in New Zealand. John, of course, uh, was a superb player in his own right and, and brought the best out of us. I would unashamedly say that John Dawes um, has had more influence on rugby and the way it's played than any other player, coach I have ever known. He changed the way that New Zealand played their game by masterminding the, the beating of them down there. He certainly changed the whole tempo of the game in Wales and the modern game it's evolved out of that. Fenwick clips it to Edwards. Edwards An end to his playing career, but John Dawes wasn't finished. He went on to coach Wales, winning the Five Nation Championship four times, including two Grand Slams. The whole of Wales absolutely overjoyed because they've got the Grand Slam back again. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest ever Welsh coach is, of course, in 1999, he was recognised for his magnificent achievements. The London Welsh honour wall is dominated by Dawes and the teams he built. Before they leave, the club have unlocked the shrine to allow his son and grandsons a close-up glimpse of a lifetime of memories. First time we ever touched his jersey. To be able to open up those cabinets and actually touch the hallowed jersey of the captain of the British Lions who went down under with 32 of his mates and beat them. It is quite, it was quite a special moment. Spine tingly at times, it's spine tingly. Looking around at all he's left, it's just, you do feel that real sense of pride now because you know everything he achieved with that club and where he took that club to is on display there. For me, it was quite tough seeing him, seeing pictures of him and his name on the wall. It was uh, sad, but also made you proud because his, his legacy, his memory, it just lives on. You are representing the name and there's, there's this legacy that he has brought, you know, it does carry with us, you know, obviously the same surname is that we want to carry that forward and, you know, make him prouder, you know, as he's made us proud. Nowadays people look back on those, those times with a lot more fondness and realise it was a special time. It was great to watch and I think the mark he left in rugby football brings a smile to everybody's face and that's basically what he loved doing. He liked having fun and enjoying himself and making everyone smile. And I think he did that. We have now developed this dedication, which the All Blacks have. We've always had the skill, but perhaps not this dedication. And this Lions Tour has proved that if you want to succeed in the modern game, You've got to have this dedication and you've got to also be well coached.